I'm kind of more worried about the rest of the country, which, thanks to police inaction, in case you haven't noticed, is like boarded up. <laughs> so that's more my concern. Well, but I appreciate you coming look, on, Ed Gavin. Thank look, you. Look. Nope, done. Uh, but in my case, on any given day, there were two or three dozen uh, what I call knuckleheads uh, who just wanted, they wanted chaos. Uh, they wanted it all their way or no way. And, you know, American democracy just doesn't work that way. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Muckrake Podcast. I'm Jared Yates Sexton. Here, as always, with Nick Houseman. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we, we've got a special one for you today. Um, friend of the pod and one of the best writers and political thinkers out there, uh, Wajahat Ali, is coming on. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with him that we are really excited to talk about, uh, including, you know, the American right continuing to lose their mind. Um, and on that subject... Uh, before we bring on Waj, um, we're, 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 the, occasionally, Nick, there, there's an article that comes out. And, okay. and, and, and those articles, sometimes, sometimes words will come out and they'll change the world. You think like Thomas Paine's common sense could help, you know, start a war for independence. And, you know, the, 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 the theses of Martin Luther posted on a church door. Mm-hmm. So before we get to this conversation, um, I think this is, I think this is a uh, a seminal text, is what I'll say. A touchstone, if you will. A real touchstone text, and uh, we're we're going to take a look at it because I actually think this this did so much for me in starting to not just I've I've understood what the rights thought is and what they're going, and we've called it delusional. We've called it another reality. This actually sheds some light on something that we've been we've been groping for in the dark, Nick. And I, I'm and, and and by the way, we like to surprise each other on this podcast. Mm-hmm. So Nick has not read this article, and I am very excited to read a little bit of this article to him. So to understand the conservative, quote unquote conservative, because they're not actually conservative, right in America, uh, we would like to take a look at a, uh, a really incredible article in the Orlando Sentinel, which, you know, is where you go. I love Disney World, but wokeness is ruining the experience. Womp womp. How do, how do you feel right now? How do you, how do you feel before we even like start to wade into this? There's no question that the, my enjoyment of a place like Disney World is clearly going to be affected by wokeness. By wokeness. Uh, this is by Jonathan Van, Van Boskirk, uh, which, by the way, we are recording this. I just want to say before we even start talking about this, we're recording this on Monday, April 26th. Uh, yesterday, for those who are not on the Internet, and good for you, God bless, uh, you might have missed that the American right talked itself into the idea that Joe Biden was going to limit Americans to four pounds of red meat a year. And so every person in the American right immediately went out and consumed four <laughs> pounds of meat immediately, <laughs> despite it being completely made up. So let's let's try and understand our uh, our, our country people. My family and I have been loyal Disney customers for decades. We vacation at Disney World every year. We take a Disney cruise every year or two. Consequently, we spend way too much money in Orlando. I, w- I would say way too much. Sure. I, w- I would say way too much. I would agree. Yeah, put it in Bitcoin. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm strongly rethinking our commitment to Disney and thus Orlando. The more Disney moves away from the values and vision of Walt Disney. Um, real fast, a quick footnote, Nick. What, oh, what, were, the, what were the vision and values of Walt Disney? <laughs> uh, they they, uh, they aligned probably closer to uh, maybe Hitler than they did to uh, FDR, for instance, I would think. Yeah, uh, for those who don't know, Walt Disney was a notorious anti-Semite. And on top of that, was involved in a Hollywood group, which made sure that all entertainments coming out of Hollywood were strictly pro-American, which made them propaganda for uh, the right in America for a very long time and actually did a great job of uh, indoctrinating people for a very long time. The more Disney moves away from the values and visions of Walt Disney, the less Disney World means to me. Disney is forgetting that guest immersion guest immersion is at the core of its business model when i stand in galaxy's edge or fantasy land fantasy land by the way i know i am in a theme park but through immersion and my willingness to set the real world aside something magical happens 
That spell is broken when the immersive experience is shattered by the real world. And boy, has Disney been breaking the immersion. Do you want to guess where this is going, Nick? I mean, I, I, generally it's going to have to be something like maybe they're speaking in Spanish as well as English or something like that for the instructions on the rides. I don't know. Recently, Disney announced that cast members are now permitted to display tattoos, wear inclusive uniforms, and display inclusive haircuts. Do, do, do we want to go ahead and translate what he's saying? <laughs> uh, yeah, you have to be, uh, we have to look like you're out of uh, Pleasantville or something, I suppose. Yeah, he's saying they're, they're letting people of color express themselves at Disney World. Disney did all of this in the name of allowing cast members to express themselves. The problem is, I'm not traveling across the country and paying thousands of dollars to watch someone I do not know express themselves. I am there for the immersion and the fantasy, not the reality of a stranger's self-expression. I do not begrudge these people their individuality, and I wish them well in their personal lives. Do you? But I do not get to express my individuality at my place of business. I've got something, a revelation for you as well that goes exactly with what, having not known that you wanted to talk about this today. I walked around a mall yesterday for the first time in 13, 14 months. Not that I did it that often when I was, when it, before the pandemic, but sure. I walked around and I, and I, you know, all of a sudden, and it's crowded, right? Most people sure. wearing masks, it's just fine. Most people, some people, you know, nose covered, uncovered and some people without anything. But what I, I kind of felt like was hitting me was that we're now uh, out and about and we're now faced with people who don't look like us. And if you had spent any time indoors over the last year in the pandemic and now you are out about again, this is going to now um, the agita is going to be stirred up mm -hmm. in a way that maybe you had, you know, yes, perhaps you get used to it. You get used to being around people who don't look like you in normal circumstances. And now that we're back to this again, you know, it's getting stirred up in worse ways than ever before. And we get shit like this. Well, you're exactly right. There is going to be there are going to be some social and political ramifications. There absolutely are. It's like being out in the public sphere is going to be something. But I will say. The idea that like people can't express themselves because they're going to interrupt the childish fantasy of some white dude at an amusement park, there is no better concentrated definition of white exceptionalism and American exceptionalism. This idea that, oh, you know, I, these people, I have no problem with these people, but, you know, they need to wear their clothes a certain way. They need to speak a certain way. They have to behave a certain way or else they're going to make me uncomfortable and ruin my fantasy. What we're talking about is the American rights fantasy which is being interrupted. The idea that they're good people and that America is like a totally perfect, godly, chosen place and that they're not actually hurting anybody. They're just asking everyone, you know, maybe uh, what is it? What's the old shit, right? Like pull up your pants or wear your hat the right way or whatever it is that they make up, right? Which is whatever that makes them feel uncomfortable. It's not a delusion. It's not uh, it's it's not this sort of lie that they're telling themselves. They're worried about their fantasy right. is what it is. But let, let me just give you an insight into someone who actually has a, a pass to Disneyland in the wonderful world of you know California. We go a lot. OK, so this notion of a fantasy, like I don't even understand where he's going with that anyway, because let's face it, especially if you're an adult. It's 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 a slog. It's hard. It's crowded. It's a lot of lines. It's not like that fantasy gets interrupted every second unless you're maybe for that one brief moment on the Harry Potter ride or whatever. Or that's universal, but whatever, where you can kind of get immersed the rest of the time. You are just faced with reality the whole time. So I this is really a veiled article, right? He's not necessarily even talking about Disney World specifically. You know what I mean? I don't know if that's true. Well, I think so. What you're actually talking about, and this is an important thing, and I hope we get to talk to Waj about this. You're actually talking about the difference between being a mature adult living in a material world versus someone who lives in like gleeful denial. Do you uh, know what I mean? That's like, interesting. like, like, so for instance, like we have this podcast where we talk about American realities and deep politics and what's actually going on. Like we're talking about like what is actually occurring 
in the world and how it occurs and how it transpires and why it occurs, right? Mm -hmm. Now, people might say that's cynical. It's not actually cynical. It's materialistic. We're talking about things that are actually happening and how they happen. This person is living in a fairy tale with Tinkerbell and Captain Hook and Pluto and God knows who else just showing up and living out this weird fantasy where people are supposed to uh, wear their clothes for his approval. They're supposed to cut their hair for his approval or hide their tattoos for his approval. Who the hell is this person? Right. Because so, you're right. It's not an adult it's not an adult perspective whatsoever. And and also, so if you're talking about the hair and the and tattoos, it's not the people wearing the costumes that are walking around like Minnie Mouse and whatever. These are obviously, he's talking about people who are like at the cash registers, I suppose, right? Like this right. is even, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure that the Venn diagram between him and the people who can't stand going to like a football game and seeing the players kneel uh, are probably, this. it's a circle, right? This is the same idea. Uh, sports is not for politics. It's for, you know, just for Wait, the- as they end- Roll a giant American flag on the field and the troops <laughs> march out and we say we salute our troops. Right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and then, but then we have to play on their playing field. So we, we talked about this before, but like the notion of them thinking that kneeling, for instance, before a football game or basketball game is an affront to the flag or to our troops versus a, a statement about the cops killing black people. Uh, they think that they get to decide what terms these things mean to, to them versus what the people who are doing them mean why they're doing them. And that's that kind of is the umbrella patriarchal white grievance thing we've been talking about in a nutshell, right? They get to define the terms and they get to define their grievance. I, 100%. And by the way, everything that you're talking about is intellectually true, but I'm going to go ahead and reduce it down to the common sort of lowest base instinct. And listen, you're a father. Mm -hmm. I am, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm just on this side of 40, but I still remember what it's like to be a child. I have friends who have children. We're talking about childish behavior. Think about what we're talking about here. My trip to Disney World isn't the way that I wanted. And so as a result, I'm going to stomp my feet and yell about it and demand somebody make it different. I'm going to eat as much food as I want, and I don't care if it makes me sick or if it hurts anybody else. You can't take Dr. Seuss away from me. You can't take my book away from me with the colorful Im images and its happy racism. This is childish behavior. It is such... An immature, and, and you know how kids can be when they're little. They don't have that sort of filter where it's like the world has to bend to whatever they want at any given time. We're dealing with a population that is lost in childish fantasy at this point. I mean, I had a girlfriend who had a Marvin the Martian tattoo. Is that not acceptable to use a Disney character uh, as a tattoo if you're working? That's not Disney. Marvin is not? What is he, WB? No, are you kidding me? Is it WB? What is that? I don't even know. That's WB. He, oh, well. did, uh, he did battle with Daffy Duck. Sorry. I mean, I am known to, to wear Adidas and Nike uh, at the same time, so forgive me for, for the faux pas. But, that makes me itchy, Nick. Oh, oh no. That's so, so that's the point. It's like, because like, let's really unpack exactly what the reaction is that he's having sure. to blue hair, right? I'm assuming is what he's talking about. Or like, I don't know, not, not Mohawk or something, right? Like, I bet it's like dreadlocks. Okay. I oh, bet I see. Natural hair. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I almost guarantee. Like this entire article, like he does everything that he can not to say black. You know right, what I mean? Right. Black and Hispanic. Like he does everything possible to not have to say that. Yeah. And so as a result, listen, I, I pride myself in you know walking around people's shoes for a minute, however dirty those shoes are, um, <laughs> and. The question then is, okay, so he sees this, he's faced with it, and in his mind, he's being reminded of the other, right? The replacement. Right. I, yes. right? We have to sort of figure yes. out what this, what the connection from one end of the brain to the other is. And it's, it's, right, he's obviously upset about it, so he doesn't want to be reminded of the, you know, what the influx of other people that don't look like him. I'm right. There's, is there any other way we can define what he's going through in this? In this no, pain? because the world stops and starts at his beck and call. And that's what he wants. And that's what that's what white Americans want. It's not enough that white Americans have power. It's not enough that white Americans control politics and culture. They want people to not only like 
let that alone. They want people to thank them for it. Right. Which is what we see constantly. It's like anytime LeBron James like utters a cross word, they're like, well, he's not grateful. Right. Oh, yeah. He's Jeez. not. He's not properly grateful and look at this country that allowed him to make the money and have the name that he does he should be grateful and that is it, it all has to do with this absolute nonsensical bullshit reality that these people live in i, th I, I thought that this was an absolutely incredible article for like exposing that mindset because they can't talk about what they're talking about if he was talking about race, if he was talking about politics, that would be a problem. He's talking about something else away from it. Well, uh, thankfully, some of these other people on that side are talking about it. And are and I don't think it's a slip up anymore, right? They are out loud saying the quiet parts. And as we saw earlier uh, today, as released by Rick Santorum on a video, which we'll talk about. But, uh, you know, that's the other thing is we this is not in a bubble, right? This ideology and this article is not written uh, with nothing behind it and no history of what we've been going through for, you know, since the start of this country for, for basically. Um, and that's the thing. You have to be able to piece these things together and it, it becomes a mosaic. Uh, a very racist mosaic. And that's what I think the self-reflection or lack thereof uh, doesn't allow them to see how they are uh, fomenting the hatred. And as a result, uh, you know, we got back to that same idea where if it's not the N word, he didn't say anything. You know, there's not a word you can do in a word search that will prove that it's racist, that it's not racist. And there's no systemic racism. I mean, that's how dare, how dare you, Nick? He just wants his Disney world. Uh, God, the humanity. All right, we, we got to bring Waj on to talk about this. I'm really excited to talk to Waj about Disney World and uh, Rick Santorum and uh, Tucker Carlson. So uh, hang on for just a second. We're going to have Daily Beast columnist uh, Wajahad Ali with us here in just a moment. All right, people, we are here, and this is a special treat. We have Wajahad Ali, a uh, columnist for Daily Beast, uh, one of the smartest people out there, uh, has had everything dead to rights for a very long time. I, I, I just told Waj I was very excited because before we brought him on, uh, we were talking about this wonderful article in the Orlando Sentinel about a uh, Republican uh, Disney World patron who was upset about his fantasy being interrupted by park workers with uh, what he called, and, and, and I'll go ahead and make sure I have this right, inclusive haircuts inclusive haircuts and inclusive tattoos uh that they were ru ruining his fantasy we uh were talking about how the american right has been engaged not just in like a delusional reality but a fantasy and i think that is just about the most perfect way to actually talk about this because it's people of color and poor people who are just ruining that fantasy wash it's just really ruining that immersion for them i, I need more racist crows from Dumbo. <laughs> this is what I need in my life. I need more racist crows talking jive to a flying elephant. Uh, this is what tethers me to the ground of Americana. This is how, you know, when I, when I think of America, I think of Jesus, racist <laughs> crows, uh, brooms that are dancing, uh, Mickey Mouse. And, and that's, you know, that's what our founding fathers and the prophets really wanted. Uh, USA. But then, USA. Yeah, yeah, USA. But, then, but then when you see like a fade haircut or when you see braids, that 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 is what knocks me off my pedestal of reality. I, I need <laughs> I need to be immersed in, in a small world after all, literally. <laughs> yeah, you are the aware pirates of the Caribbean. The pirates have to be white. They're being mm. replaced by some Jamaicans. I can't have that. I mean, here's the thing. I want them to be scary, but not too scary. Right. Like if I'm going to Disney World, I don't want to be made that uncomfortable. Right. In my lily white reality. Like, but but didn't but didn't Captain Jack Sparrow have like uh, different hair and like gold teeth and tattoos? How come that's OK? <laughs> like, no, one, like I want to like logically take this to the next level. Right. Because I've gone to D uh, Disney World a couple of times. My wife's from Florida. And so we have kids. And before the lockdown, we went. And so they re-updated Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, in light of the massive success of the the of the now what four or five movies, and so they they replaced those old lily white pirates with these funky new Jack Sparrow pirates with tattoos. But that's okay. But uh, God forbid if you have uh, uh, some new inclusive hair. What exactly is an inclusive haircut? <laughs> inclusive. I, in this day and age, 
<laughs> I think all of us are at that certain age that if we have hair on our head, we're just grateful. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, like I feel like I'm a hu I'm like a, a, a South Asian unicorn. I'm, I'm 40 years old with hair on my head. Like any hair, like I, it just makes me happy. Inclusive you know what? I think you and I have like written for enough editors. I think that we can read a column and we can feel the touch of an editor. You know what I mean? Where they like move somebody towards words. I would love to see that rough cut and see what those hairstyles were called in the first draft. Yeah, I, I, I think whoever published that is like, this is going to go viral. This is amazing. This is going to be a nonsense uh, cultural war that will pit the left versus the right. And we will have something fake to talk about in addition to Biden stealing our meat, which uh, is now, you know, because they went so far. They went like for months with Dr. Seuss, which was very impressive considering a pandemic and a recession. Right. Like they they milked Dr. Seuss for like four months. And then now the base needs something like the base literally needs meat. Like we need to be fed anger and rage and conspiracy theories. So let's give them Disney World and inclusive haircuts. And uh, which was exquisite. It's like everything about that. Even the photo, fo the photo, the, the guy looking at like the, the guy, the, 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 the figurines in the background. It's it just it's, it's mwah, chef's kiss. It's beautiful. Well, you know, we were talking earlier about what the the glitch is in the brain when he's subjected to these images, kind of like in uh, Clockwork Orange, right, where his eyes are forced open. And he has to see these people. Uh, what what do you think? Uh, what is it that's conjuring up that's making him so upset that he has to actually run to uh, write a column about it? Uh, you know, he probably noticed that Goofy has black ears for the first time and is wearing his <laughs> like hat sideways. Uh, that could be very triggering for a grown white man, you know, like I'm used to Goofy wearing his hat in a very one directional way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he probably saw uh, Minnie Mouse flirting uh, a little <laughs> bit with maybe uh, Daphne. I don't know. Maybe they were just friends, but he probably thought there was some like lesbianism happening you know, that triggered him. Uh, you know, th this is one of those things where you in all seriousness, you will. It shows the obsession and the fear uh, of a particular mindset. Right. So if you. If you are obsessed with this fear, you will literally see it in the most benign uh, things such as Disney. So if you are literally terrified of black and brown people uh, as your neighbors, if you're literally terrified of LGBT people, if you're terrified of Muslims, if you're terrified of a name which has more than two syllables, if you're terrified of saying the word Kamala, uh, and that is what's force fed. Uh, to you, to your brain, to your eyes, like in Clockwork Orange, right, 24-7 through a right-wing ecosystem. It's not just Fox News, right? It's the podcast. It's Fox News. It's talk radio. It's the online uh, 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 essays, right? It's an entire closed ecosystem with a 24-7 information loop. Then that literally colors your perception of the world to the point where you can go to Disney World, and instead of just enjoying it's a small world, you're looking at that brown... I didn't see that brown kid in America. <laughs> Where did that brown kid come from? It was used to be Lily White. They're replacing us. It's really fascinating. Yeah, you know, I, I'm so glad you brought up the meat thing. I, I had a moment yesterday where, you know, it's like social media has like this weird sort of barometer that you see these things start to percolate up. Right. All of a sudden, the rumor began that Biden was going to limit Americans to four pounds of meat a year as some sort of like a, you know, uh, uh, fight against uh, climate change, which was completely nonsense. This right. has not been written down anywhere. Like somebody somewhere said these are ways that maybe Americans could decide to help out. And then immediately it was like after lunch, apparently the entire American right got very, very hungry and needed some red meat in their lives. And they all went out and basically bought like five pound pot roast and then cooked them <laughs> in the most disgusting possible way yeah. and then consumed it. And basically, and, and this is no joke, you want to like actually talk about like the concrete effects of this. They were ingesting dangerous amounts of meat for themselves while also actually going ahead and adding to a very real problem that will affect them and also their children. It was it was a suicidal self-harm kind of an action, which is the American right in a nutshell right now. And it was completely fabricated, completely uh, astroturf, no truth to it whatsoever. But we're watching this this train come off the tracks. And I mean, it didn't have many wheels on the tracks to begin with. It's self-immolation. I think that's the key thing. It's it's dying for whiteness. It's dying yeah. to own the libs. But at the end of the day, you kind of sit there and observe. And it's really, it is sad in a way. 
because you are destroying yourself, right? Like, first of all, you're destroying your colon. So, like, your colon's like, why? Why did I have to be attached to a right winger? <laughs> oh, why couldn't I have been attached to a vegan? Just like, you know, this, this bleeding colon that's just crying in pain after eating like a 10 pound uh, steak. Uh, but also, like, you know, it, it's, it's, it was manufactured by the right wing. And it just shows that when the right wing now exists in the conspiracy theorist bubble, because that's where it exists, right? Let's not forget that last year, the right wing, uh, specifically, I'm talking about the GOP establishment, uh, met and they had a decision to make about QAnon. And they decided that QAnon is so influential with their base that they're going to roll with it. So now they're re rolling with QAnon and Deep State, which I always want to remind people our law enforcement has said is a national security threat. So when 4chan and 8chan and Deep State and QAnon are part and parcel of your information network, what else do you expect? And so Greg Abbott, the, t uh, the governor of Texas, who has been remarkable in killing so many of his Texas residents, even he retweeted it, right? And it goes to show you that once you get hit by the right wing, because I've been hit by the right wing, I think, Jared, you have been as well. I'm convinced they're like on the same Slack channel. I completely WhatsApp agree. Group, because like Daily Caller comes out three minutes later, Washington Examiner, yep. five minutes later, a politician, 10 minutes later, Fox News, later at night, copy on Tucker. It's copy for Tucker Carlson's monologue, right? How does this magically happen? Same talking point, same fear, same conspiracy, same words. They're obviously working together in a closed information network, and they're feeding this literally red meat to their base and their base is killing themselves because uh, if you give your base an enemy and if you tell them that enemy is coming after them our primordial brain says fight or flight i have to survive i have to protect my children any means necessary and if that means i have to go kill a cow and put that cow on my plate and destroy my colon damn it i'm gonna do that well i think we'd be remiss if we didn't at least acknowledge the uh the methane problem as well, because that seems to be the biggest fear for me, both individually and then in the cows. But I, I'm, I'm Waj, are you are you just are you really, really just do you, do you say a thank you every day when you wake up that John Boehner has come out and sort of tried to explain to us all how much uh, the, the Republican Party is a, a party of, of conspiracies and nut jobs? Do you feel like that's a, how, how important his statement has been? I, I think so. I think we all uh, owe a standing ovation and slow golf clap to John Boehner uh, for now in his retirement uh, as he's smoking cigars and uh, doing his audio version with profanities laced towards uh, <laughs> Ted Cruz. You know, the hero. Oh, oh, the sacrifice that you made, Boehner. Like, I did not get on this Boehner praise train because Boehner is utterly complicit in what the GOP has become. This guy knew exactly where the train was headed, and I think he instead of being praised, it should be condemned because, bro, you knew. You're admitting that you knew. And when you had an opportunity to step up and warn this country to save this country from this impending extremist outfit posing as the GOP, what did you do? Nothing. And, you know, and even now he does nothing. Like, did he vote for uh, Obama? No. Did he vote for uh, 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 Biden? No. And so why should I applaud you for getting a six-figure, maybe seven-figure book deal, and now that it's all safe, you can swear out Ted Cruz when, if when you had the platform, you could have said, I am renouncing this. The GOP is going off the rails. I'm warning my GOP brethren. I'm warning the political ecosystem. But he kept quiet. And his complicity will always be remembered, at least by me, at least by you. And I think it's important. Because yeah. the White House press, let's not forget, the last thing I'll say is the White House press, this is why it's so, it's, you know, for those people who are listening, you know, I'm in, I'm in Virginia, close to D.C., you know, I used to be a commentator for CNN, uh, contributor to New York Times, right? I can tell you that the way the town works is this incestuous network, right? Mm -hmm. I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back, we'll be friends, uh, you know, uh, it's all about access. So Boehner used to host all these journalists mm -hmm. Uh, you know, while he was the, in, in Congress and used to regale them with stories. And I'm sitting there as the press is sitting there talking about, oh, Boehner, he used to tell us great stories. Ha, ha, ha. I'm like, why are we so chummy with Boehner? Like, it just shows you how everything is so gross, that it's so incestuous, that he's able to wine and dine you afterwards. And you go, go to him for scoops, but you didn't press him. And now that he comes out and says this, it's like, oh, we're supposed to applaud Boehner, not me. Yeah, it's it's weird how far sort of, uh, the, you know, bullshitting with those people will get you. I mean, George W. Bush is doing that exact same thing right now and being rehabilitated by uh, 
everybody on the map really right now. Um, I, I was I brought you uh, uh, on here because I wanted to talk to you about a thing that I felt like you have nailed dead to the wall. Unfortunately, Nick and I have uh, been covering this. This has become one of our basically you know weekly segments, which is the ascent of uh, one Tucker Carlson. Oh yeah, and um, I was I was chatting with somebody the other day, DMing with them, and they said, and I'm going to remember this for a long time, he smells it. And by that, like, this is a thing where Tucker Carlson is obviously, he recognizes what's going on. This is a guy who understands messaging. He's, you talk about the parties, he's been in every party, every network, everywhere, all along the place. He now recognizes where the wind is blowing. He understands that white nationalism, anti-majoritarian politics, also a politics of, of rage and paranoia and conspiracy theories. Um, where it is going, he is obviously cresting with this wave. How, how are you feeling about this thing right now? Because I think it is a walking nightmare. Yeah, the, uh, I said the hoods are off. Uh, and the hoods probably have been off for a while. And people say, oh, why has the hood been off since 1950s? However, I want to say this is, um, if you go to 1980, right, Lee Atwater, Republican yep. strategist uh, for the Republicans, openly said in a famous quote, right, we can no longer say the N-word. And he said the N-word. It used to be N-word, 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 but we can no longer say it. And so now we had to change the words. And you have to make it so nebulous that you're pretty much giving, you know, these dog whistles, right, like welfare queens and so forth. So that was the 80s. The Republican Party courted white rage, specifically during the 60s, with the Civil Rights Act and the Immigration and Nationality Act. And that's how they lost so many of these Southern white Democrats, right, who became Republican. And Goldwater was the first one to recognize it. Nixon kind of really honed it. Reagan and Bush kind of perfected it, especially when Bush went with white evangelicals, right? But McCain and Romney were kind of the last gaps. They were, you know, what I always tell people is the Republican Party for the past 50 years has actively courted at, at, as like their Luca Brasi. It's ugly, it's disgusting, but we're going to unleash this hitman to win over the votes, but we're in control. We're in control of Frankenstein. Well, what Trump did is Frankenstein escaped, right, and turned on its masters, literally. All those architects like Boehner, uh, people like all the architects of the Iraq war. I'm so happy that George W. Bush now is now known as an eccentric painter who gives toffee to Michelle Obama. But he's an architect of one of the most disastrous wars and Katrina and racism. Right? Terrible. For those of us who are, are old enough to remember, his eight years were terrible. Uh, but now the hoods are off and Tucker smells it. He sees it. He understands it. He goes, there's no going back. Uh, this is the party of QAnon. This is the party of insurrection. This is the party of literally the replacement theory. And I'll give you one example because everyone's focusing on Tucker. I've written about him and, and I'll keep bringing it up. Paul Gosar. Paul Gosar in February literally gave the keynote address to a white supremacist organization, then came back and tweeted out a white supremacist slogan and has yet to be condemned by Republican leadership, at least back in the day, and I'm talking about a couple of years ago, Steve King of Iowa, Iowa was forced uh, to kind of like be uh, sacrificed by the Republican Party, right? Remember, they stripped him uh, yeah. of his committees. Well, what's the difference between what Steve King is saying and what Gosar, Marjorie uh, Taylor Greene, and Tucker Carlson are saying? Literally nothing. nothing. And that shows you the shift. So when people say, oh, Waj, no, it's always been this way, what I try to say is, yes, but at least it was covert. Now it's not covert. And this is why we're in really dangerous territory because you and I have been warning people about this for the past five, six years. And everyone says, oh, Waj, the center will hold. And I'm like, I believe Gosar, Tucker, and Marjorie Taylor Greene are the present and future of the party. And I hope I'm proven wrong, but I don't think I will be. Well, here's an interesting question because we spent time talking about Tucker and how he's intoxicating to his audience. But now I'm starting to wonder, is he really a great salesman? Because he does say things like, well, we know the, the, uh, what happened to the Capitol wasn't such a big deal. That, that is fact. Like the, That is fact is his big you know, key word, key phrase. But now I'm starting to wonder, maybe he isn't really a great salesman. Maybe they're already so conditioned for this that it doesn't take any kind of presentation to, to further this ideology. What, what do you think? Yeah, I actually agree with you. That, that, that uh, I don't praise Tucker for this because um, I remember when, uh, like, who did Tucker take over for, right? Everyone forgets, Bill O'Reilly. And when we were growing up <laughs> back in the day, in the, I'm talking about 2003, 4, 5, 6, Bill O'Reilly was the bad guy. He was the Tucker. I always used to say that the way this ecosystem is set up, it's like Hydra. 
right? You cut off one, another will take its place, literally. And so when people said, oh, Bill O'Reilly's gone, there'll be change. I'm like, nope. Tucker just fit right into that spot. And then who fit in right after Tucker? Laura. And so it doesn't matter. Even if Tucker gets felled by some insane, let's say he says something so egregious that Lachlan Murdoch is forced to part with him. It doesn't matter. They'll bring in Don Dan Bongino, right? All they need is someone to parrot the talking points. That's all they need. The bar is very low. These people aren't that charismatic. They aren't that smart. Uh, it's not like they're really good looking and brilliant. They're not that witty. They're not funny. Uh, but they need someone to feed them. And so the the base has been so conditioned, right? And the base has become radicalized where I have said, and I hope I'm wrong that I've said this to Jared, I think in our lifetime, you know, our respective age group, I think we've lost about a quarter of Americans. We're not going to get them back. I think we've lost them. But we can still get the majority. And I do think in a strange way, like if this might be some gilded touch to this, because they have nothing left except white rage, in an age where there's a pandemic and a recession, you saw the late, latest poll numbers, pretty remarkable for Biden. It's not sticking with the majority, but they'll get this 25 to 33%, which is pretty terrifying that, you know, we, we would assume in a normal sane democracy, five to 10% are cranks. This ain't five to 10%, guys. And so 25 to 33% could do a lot of damage. That's my fear. And they've already done a ton of damage. I mean, and, and on top of that, like, um, you know, we, we've been talking about this for a while now, Waj. It's as they recognize that their fate, I mean, they're, they're, in, they're in historically unpopular. Nobody yeah. wants them, right? Except for like this core group of what you're talking about. And these actions that they're taking, um, everyone's like, I can't believe that they're, you know, disenfranchising people so uh, openly or that they're making it legal to run over protesters. Or if you protest the wrong thing, you'll get student aid taken away, possibly your vote taken away, all of these, you know, sort of public goods. And the whole point is they're desperate. They have no other choice because they are they they have made a decision and they made a decision going back into 2012 when Obama won re-election. They knew they needed to oh, enlarge their umbrella, move away from their native xenophobic politics, and they made a decision. They went all in on Donald Trump and they have no other recourse at this point. They are desperate and they are trying to keep themselves from being uh, politically eradicated. It's a death spiral, right? And so... Uh, I, I've said this before, and people say, what do you mean? And so I said, we're witnessing the death rattle of white supremacy, which has become a death march, right? And so the surge is because they know they're dying, right? Yep. It's like it's like uh, an animal that's most dangerous right before it's put to bed, hopefully. Uh, and this is why you're seeing it. It's global too, right? And, and I've been kind of like researching this for about 10 years when I focused on the Islamophobia industry in America. Uh, about these ca characters and this ecosystem that emerged. Uh, and I warned as many people as I could, and people just didn't listen. I tried my, I said, listen, this is going to be, uh, it's not just going to be in America, it's global, yep. it's interconnected. And you guys are saying that love is going intersectional, so is hate, because it's not just anti Muslim, it's anti black, yep. anti Latino, anti immigrant, it's especially anti woman. People don't see that angle often. Um, and it's anti-LGBT, and they're going to combine their forces, right? It's going to be like the Brotherhood of Mutants. If we're the X-Men, it's going to be the Brotherhood of Mutants. And the New York Times did this huge piece that came out uh, two days ago talking about how American Islamophobes and the American right wing are literally paying for uh, Tommy Robinson, this EDL uh, white extremist who's gone mainstream with white nationalism, white nationalism in Britain, right? So you're literally seeing this, this fertilization all around in Hungary, in Poland, in France, in England. This is not just an American phenomenon. And the right wing realizes they're onto something, which is why Steve Bannon, remember, yep. Steve Bannon went to Europe. He was talking Started about- Started academies. Yeah, yeah. He talked to uh, uh, Le Pen's party. He says, wear it with pride. You know, and like, talked to Alexander Dugan in Russia. I mean, all of these people are comparing notes and bringing- And yeah. Robinson's going to Russia now. The article said now, now that it's like, you know, there's a backlash. In, in England, there's a, and the money's running dry. Where are they going? Uh, Russia. And yep. so Russia is like, great, if I can foment a disruption like I did in 2016 around race and religion, let me do it again. Uh, and and, it, and it's, it's, it, the sad part is, going back to your point, Jared, it is a self-immolation of our democracy. But I don't think people care. I think, you know, they're like, I would, ra I remember that someone showed, showed me an article, like, right wing came after me last year. I was on CNN. 
I gave an analogy. I said for some of these people on the right wing, if you gave them a choice, and this is, again, a, a metaphorical analogy of renting their room to a person of color or burning down the house, they'll burn down the neighborhood. And of course, you're like, well, John Dali says white people will burn down the neighborhood. I have a black neighbor. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm like, and then I'm like, lo and behold, was I proven right? Look at January 6th. Um, so this is where we're at. And people still don't want to see it. And I think the last thing I'll say is the reason why I don't think people want to see it is because people don't want to talk about white supremacy. Yep. If you talk about it, you have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge your role. And then you have to acknowledge what we're going to do to dismantle it. No one wants to have that conversation. So everyone says, we voted for Obama. We live in a post-racial society. Oh, look, so many people of color nominated for Oscars. Let's not talk about the real problem. Both well, sides. Now that you bring that up really quickly to, before we finish this off, I, uh, I, I take it you saw Judas and the Black Messiah. Is that, is that yes. safe to say? Um, yes. I watched it the other night, and, I'm, and I started to realize like, what they were, the Black Panthers were advocating for. Oh. Um, so uh, I, my, my, my question was, I'm thinking about this, is what they were advocating for, aside from any kind of the violent uh, you know, things that they might have done as Black Panthers, but the things they were advocating for, I don't think, has anything changed? I mean, we still have police killing people of color. We still have terrible education system. We don't have health care, right? Like, d does that ring true to you too? Like, we're not—we haven't even gotten anywhere from 1970. No, I mean, if I was watching Ma Rainey uh, yesterday uh, on Netflix, it's an August Wilson play made into a movie, uh, and I think that that takes place in the 40s. And just some of the the monologues uh, that the black musicians give, similar. It's like, you know, it's like these white producers are going to come and take our money. They only want us for uh, our talent, but we're going to get no power in front of them. We have to nod our head, but behind our back, you know, we have to plot resistance. And you're like, huh, that sounds very topical, the conversations we're having now. Uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, right? It's like very topical. Selma, why, why, did this, why, do, why are these stories, these historical stories so resonant? Is because we're still dealing with the same problems. And Jared mentioned it. Look at voter suppression. This is nothing new. The South, not even just the South, white America did everything in its power uh, after 1865 to make sure that black people and people of color knew their place. And so when people say that the filibuster is a relic of the Jim Crow, it is. Obama said that. When people say that these new voting uh, uh, voter suppression laws in Georgia and basically all across America are reminiscent of Jim Crow, it's because it is. This is white supremacy trying its hardest, trying its best, trying its damnest to hold on to power by any means necessary. Um, and that's what we're witnessing. And this is where we need white allies to step up. Absolutely. And by the way, it's incredible how much that colorblind, Atwater, Reagan-esque, like just screwed with everybody's perception of progress. Like everything's fine after 1980. Like we don't have any racism or inequality at this point. We're, we're in progress, right? We're, and we're we voted for freedom. Obama twice. Yep. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Wajahad Ali, who is a columnist with the Daily Beast, one of the best people out there. How, I got to ask, how's your book going? Uh, I have I have till May seventh to finish everything. Uh, I, I've done it. I'm just looking at final edits. Uh, my wife really likes it, so at least one person likes it. Hey, you can't beat that. All it's right, we're in good January. Before. Hopefully, 2022. I hope you guys like it. It's called uh, "Go Back to Where You Came From" and other helpful recommendations on how to become American. That's a winner of a title. That's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And they let me keep all of it. So, hooray. Wonderful. All right. Where can the good people find you, Wash? Uh, you can, I'm on the Twitters at Wajahat Lee or at Daily Beast uh, or sometimes on friendly neighborhood podcasts like yours. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks for inviting me. So that was Wajahat Ali, who is a writer for the Daily Beast and just a terrific interviewer with a great perspective on, uh, on the political landscape. So really glad that you know, we could set that up and, and bring him in. Waj is the best. Yes. Period. Yeah, he yeah. is. And it's great to be able to have him uh, just, you know, lay it out there in very uh, clean terms where we can understand what, what's going on. So uh, and what we t talked about at the end there uh, about uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, especially coming off of the Oscars, which were yesterday, which uh, you didn't watch him, did you, Jared? Yeah, of course I did. Oh, really? I, didn't, I think people don't watch him anymore. Right. It seems yeah. like. I don't know. That's fun. The, the Oscars exist for everyone to argue about whether or not the Oscars should continue existing. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, you know, it's like that. I wrote about this yesterday. It's like that 
Saturday Night Live, and uh, the royal family. They exist so we can argue about whether or not we should keep going with them. Well, you know, it's funny because I was an art major. So as an artist, like I battle constantly with this notion of like rating art and having to put one piece of art above someone else's. Oh, it's absurd. And so exactly. that's that's a trouble. And then in the in the in the crucible of like the Oscars, where you're now wearing these tens of thousands of dollars worth of you know jewelry sure. and, and, and dresses and stuff, it seems kind of crazy. But uh, but I did enjoy watching uh, Glenn Close uh, dance uh, to uh, hip hop last night. That was fun. Uh, it was totally scripted for the record, mm-hmm. and yes. uh, a lot of people didn't get that. And it was like this totally obviously scripted sort of thing and people didn't get it. I thought it was an interesting, uh, what I would call a pseudo event, which is where uh, now in popular culture, basically producers of shows, and this is in every television show and movie and basically everything you watch that has like a group of people like crafting it, they are looking for memeable content. Mm -hmm. They want something from it to be turned into a GIF or something that can be added to and edited. And that's exactly what that Glenn Close moment was. Like yeah. we were watching a meme being born like in real time. Right. And I'm okay with it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but I did want to fo- uh, bring back that notion of what we saw in Judas and the Black Messiah, which is about the Black Panthers in Chicago in 1970. Um, and I'm kind of, it just sort of struck me as the credits are rolling and I'm reflecting on what we saw. And, you know, um, the, the, it won the Academy Award for Best uh, Supporting Actor because uh, Fred Hampton, the guy who plays him, is, is, does such a great job recreating that, that person of the historical figure. The things he was advocating for, though, uh, it, it's strange. I feel like we haven't barely budged in terms of trying to meet those goals and, and what they wanted uh, back then in 1970, which is, what, 50 years ago. Uh, have we moved forward at all? I mean, please tell me that we have. You know, we have in certain ways and we have, haven't have in others. And I have to tell you, I really enjoyed Judas and the Black Messiah. And I enjoyed it for a few reasons. Number one, the performances were fantastic. But I also thought it was, going back to what we were talking about in the first segment of the show, it's a mature view of a topic. And a lot of the times you'll watch a biopic or a political pick and it just sort of treats people, you know, as we talk about, as heroes, messiahs, and, you know, villains and devils. That's not how this was. It was a complicated portrait of a complicated group. But one of the things that I appreciated about it the most is I know that when I was growing up and I grew up again in like white identity evangelical circles, I was told that the Black Panthers were a dangerous group of people, a gang, right? That was like trying to destroy America and was intent on robbing and hurting people, which is like complete white supremacist paranoia. This was a group that was incredibly dedicated to grassroots change, right? The idea of of black liberation and the idea of black power and the idea that like politics and society needed to change. And they were willing to make that change via working in their neighborhoods, working in their communities, but also forging alliances. And that was an interesting thing that that movie showed, I want to point out, is that they were willing to work with like openly racist people right and 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 they they more or less started working more towards a leftist sort of a marxist ideology which is we're all oppressed peoples and a lot of the hatred and distrust that we have are based on capitalism and and economic competition that whole point is something that has been left alone for a very long time and when we look at the 60s the civil rights movement all of that The mythology of America wants us to believe Civil Rights Act got passed. Suddenly everything was perfect, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, outwardly racist things were illegal. Well, that doesn't mean that racism went away. It actually inflamed racism and made racism burrow deep into the, the foundation of the country and work itself through more insidious means. And this is something um, that we need to realize, which is racist and white supremacist and the practitioners of racism and white supremacy, the people in power and with uh, influence, they have gotten more talented at hiding their racism and their white supremacy. They have gotten much more talented in making sure that those things are in laws and in politics without them being apparent. So a lot of the things that they were marching for in the 60s and the 70s and fighting for in those times, those things are still here. It just so happens now they're hidden under a layer of propaganda or a layer of deniable rhetoric. And that's one of the main problems we're dealing with right now. And I agree. I mean, the the fundamentals are still the issue, right? 
the, that's the yeah. issue is we still have a great, great, greatly um, unequal uh, educational system. We have uh, the economic system. So I'm kind of the other question that I have is, is what is more triggering to the right? Um, someone who wants to question the concept of economic competition, the basically our, our, the way our, our uh, economy is formed, or the, the fear and hatred of people of color. I, they, they mixed them both in one, but I'm wondering if there is one that's worse than the other to them and what triggers them. I don't know if there's any way to disconnect those two things. Aha. Uh-huh. Because, so what I, am, what I am discovering in the research that I'm doing, and again, I went, I went back to the source. Like I went back to like the beginnings of capitalism. And I have to tell you, things like race are constructs that are used to go ahead and legitimize exploitation. Right. Like, like, oh, and, and, and I have to tell you, man, it's so gross. It's like when they're talking about um, like Africans, they're talking about them as like being cursed because they're they come from Noah's cursed son, Ham. Right. Yeah. Who came across as dead. I don't know if people know this story, but Noah got shit blackout drunk one day and Ham looked upon him while he was naked and he was then cursed to be a servant. For the rest of his life and for eternity and so there was the european uh, this is true that's a hundred percent true the europeans told themselves a story about africans that they that the reason that they looked different was because they were cursed with sin and that they were the descendants of this cursed child of noah and as a result nick They shouldn't feel bad about enslaving them because they were different. They were from a different group of people and they deserved to be enslaved and it was God's plan. So that exploitation and racism, they go hand in hand because you have to you have to come up with a story for why people can be exploited, whether or not it's, oh, they're not as intelligent. Oh, they they don't understand politics. They don't understand, you know, culture. They need taken care of. Um, You know, they're lazy, you know, like all of these different things like those those mythologies are things that make people who exploit them feel okay about their exploitation. So right. all of that bullshit is like completely interconnected. And it kind of feels like the uh, the justification that the South might say for, for fighting yep. a civil war is they, you know, their economy. We need to protect our economy, but what is their economy then? Slaves, right? That's what they were fighting for, even though they can say, well, it we wasn't about slavery. That's why we weren't fighting for it, but it, it was. And they can just cover it up with different euphemisms uh, and different ways of explaining it, which is what Lee Atwater did. Have you ever seen, there's a one-man show about Lee Atwater that my, a buddy of mine did in Chicago. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, and it was a tour de force of a show where it basically, you know, before he dies, he has a kind of come to Jesus moment where he tries to acknowledge all the horrible things he did. And um, it was, to this day, I probably saw it in 1996 and it was seared into my brain because it was, A, it was a great performance, but B, what, what, what he was saying and how he was, I think he was dying of brain cancer and just lamenting his entire life basically for what he did uh which could very well be the ground zero of what we're talking about we're always trying to find that right like 12 monkeys we're trying to go back in time to figure out where that uh where it starts uh i mean certainly lee otwater has to be one of the guys i mean we go farther back but he's got to be one of the big touchstones we would look at yeah, so when we're doing our next episode of uh, our documentary series, which hopefully we'll be able to do this summer, Let's as do I soon. get done with classes, yeah, Lee Atwater is going to be a major character. And for those who haven't heard of him, um, Lee Atwater was sort of the dark prince of Republican politics uh, in in the modern era. And Atwater was this Southern good old boy who had a really um, – what do I say? Uncanny ability to understand what racist in America needed to hear and how to go ahead and translate. And one of the things that Waj uh, brought up is sort of this. It's almost like the Rosetta Stone for people who don't know. The Rosetta Stone is this thing that we found like, ar- ar- you know, archaeologically that like told us like all these different languages and sort of gave us the translation. Uh, Lee Atwater happened to give this just completely out of nowhere interview and he was at like a republican convention or event and somebody caught him in the right mood probably with a couple of drinks in him and he said to the person he's like oh yeah all of our policies are absolutely racist like we are doing this intentionally to be racist and also to appeal to racist but we have this coded language right we talk about busing we talk about taxes we talk about all of that we talk about everything from it but what we are saying is the n-word 
we can't say the N word out loud anymore. But and by the way, the the thing that's really scary, and I'm glad that uh, Waj brought this up. The thing that's really scary, and we talked about it actually last week, is when they just start saying it again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where they're just like, well, we're done. We're, we're not even going to hide behind this Atwater shit anymore. Uh, but if people want to know about him, a really good documentary is called Boogeyman, the Lee Atwater story, which gives a really good insight. And, and by the way, if you want to learn about Atwater, you're learning about Atwater. You're learning about Roger Stone. You're learning about Paul Manafort. You're learning about the the dark arts people of the Republican Party who are the ones who have always been behind the scenes pulling the dark shit, right? The rat fuckers, so to speak. And, you know, they, they and by the way, they didn't just do it for the Republican Party. They did it for warlords around the world, right? <laughs> right. Like these are some of the most damned people imaginable. But uh, yeah, to understand the modern Republican Party and their, their usage of white supremacy supremacist tropes and they're hiding of it, you have to understand that water. And then, and when you're done reading that, then you should definitely need to get Stuart Stevens' new book called It Was All a Lie, How the Republican Party Became Donald Trump, uh, because it, 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 he's, he is uh, basically at water 2.0 and lays it out in great detail exactly what they were doing. Another thing that we have to point out is not just that history doesn't look like the story that we've been told, which is about progress. Right. It's a very pruned story that that we're constantly getting better. And, yeah, some things need work, but just just to hold on. Right. Just to hold on. I promise you don't need to be in the streets. You don't need whoa, to take whoa, any whoa, radical whoa. action. Whoa. Now. And that's a, that's Tucker Carlson's specialty, mm-hmm. by the way, while we're on the subject of that, dude. Uh, but the other problem with it, and, and we need to be very clear about it because you brought up Judas and the Black Messiah. And this is an important thing that we need to talk about, which is. Fred Hampton, the subject of that movie, was murdered. He was murdered by American law enforcement. And there is a long history of revolutionaries or people who trouble a system being either murdered, harassed, uh, undermined, attacked, all of those things, including Martin Luther King Jr., who who was harassed to the point of, of, of they wanted him to kill himself. And we don't know what else happened, but it was pretty bad. Mm. It's pretty bad to look at what happens in this country when you have people who actually want to push forward reform and change. And I've talked about it on this podcast before. Not only is law enforcement and law enforcement at the federal level and intelligence at a foreign level or a, a national level, Is it dedicated to uh, suppressing reform movements? But they also work with far right movements. They they work with all these the Proud Boys, Three Percenters, Oath Keepers, you name it. Uh, before that, it was you know fascists in the streets. They work with these people because they have a common objective, which is to continue that story, to keep that manufactured history in place and unquestioned, while continuing to keep actual reform from being handled and to keep that hidden oppression that we're talking about hidden and effective and secure. Well, I, we, I've talked about this a lot in the past where I'd say, you know, if aliens came down to our, our world and observed us for a week, they would say this. They'd say, this is how it's set up on purpose, right? You want these people of color to not be able to succeed. And you want these people over here who are white. They, that's the poll. Isn't that the point? Uh, meanwhile, by the way, that's, that's going to happen, right? In like the next 25 years, we're going to make contact with... Uh, Aliens, aliens. Dude, I, I don't know about you, but it's like every day there's like new shit coming across the wire that is like weird. Yeah. I'll just say that. I can only hope that uh, they, they're they're friendly. Because <laughs> well, not, we're in trouble. Statistics show that they probably would not be. So we got right. that going for us. But we will we will tackle that at a at a at a later venture. Right now we're gonna take care of terrestrial concerns, hopefully. <laughs> it's a cookbook. <laughs> that's a that's a deep cut. Yeah. That's a deep cut that 15 people listening to. Just went, <laughs> <laughs> Look up. It's a cookbook. You'll find it. That's, that's, a, that's a good episode of TV. All right. We are uh, going to wrap this thing up. Uh, thank you again to Wajahat Ali, who is just fantastic. Um, what do you say uh, for our weekender? We'll, we'll take some questions. We'll, we'll, we'll allow the, the patrons to ask some questions. Yeah, so let's ask some questions. We'll 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 uh, open it up to our patrons to uh, ask us some questions over on the Patreon. Uh, if you're not a subscriber at this point, what are you what are you doing? 
I mean, The Weekender is a fantastic show. We have a great community uh, with the Muckrake community. Um, all you have to do is go over to patreon.com slash podcast. A lot more people are joining up, Nick. Oh, yeah. It's catching on. They're enjoying themselves. We're getting really good feedback on this stuff. I think people are, are, are really embracing the thing. So go over to patreon.com slash podcast. We'll uh, open up a, a, a post for some questions. We'll deal with those on The Weekender, which will come out this Friday, which is our patron-only exclusive show uh we will be back if you need nick before then you can find him at can you hear me smh you can find me at jy sexton stay safe everyone